Hello, statistics students. You can see I'm wearing my Iceland shirt today, so let me give you the sum total of my knowledge of the Icelandic language. Jeg tala ekki Islandsku. You can look that up. Anyway, in this lesson, we're going to learn how to see if two population means. So you have a population over here with its mean. You have a population over here with its mean. Are those two population means equal or not? <clears throat> and in this lesson, we're going to assume, you know, the what is mostly in the real world the case that we don't know the two population sigmas. So obviously, what kind of statistic is going to be involved? If you said a T statistic, you're correct. So let's start our lesson for today. First thing we're going to do is go back to the olden days. And in the olden days, before we had calculators, <clears throat> for, um, equations and formulas, they could be really tough to handle all the calculations. So we did things we could do to simplify them. And one of the things um, that simplified some really difficult formulas for us is we just assumed the variance of the first population was equal to the variance of the second population. And if that were true, we could do what was called the pooled variance. And this yucky formula here simplifies to this. And it turns out that this has um, a nice T distribution with N1 plus N2 minus two degrees of freedom. Where does this come from? Well, N1 minus one and N2 minus one, and you add those together. And you, I'm sure you remember from our previous chapter, N1 or N minus one, where, why we use that. So um, this isn't necessary to write down, but this comes from a previous textbook we've used. I'd just like you to read what I've highlighted. And as you can see, nowadays when we use software, or and software includes our you know advanced um, calculators that do statistics for us, we don't need to use this pooled statistic anymore. So if our if this is our situation, we have two populations. The first population has a mean and a standard deed. The second population has a mean and a standard D. Our null hypothesis in this lesson is that um, the mean of this population is equal to the mean of this population. Maybe it's less than or equal, maybe it's greater than or equal, but it's got to have that equal sign. And of course, the alternative hypothesis will have the, um, the strict inequality, whether it be greater than, less than, or not equal. But we are not going to assume equal variances. <clears throat> In fact, I'd say it's pretty darned unlikely that you know variance of two populations is equal. Let's just assume they're not equal. And let's let the bell ring. So our standard error, um, this, you think of it as the standard div of the differences of the two x bars. And I, we'll get to that in class. I think this is kind of a simple formula. S1 squared over N1. You take S2 squared over N2. You add those formulas and you square root it. Again, that's just a two sample analog to um, S over root N. We have the square root of S squared, which is S. We have the square root of N, which is root N. Now, there are ways to calculate the degrees of freedom, but use, they can be a bit advanced. I mean, just unpleasant formulas. If, so, if you have software available, then use the software and use the degrees of freedom that the software gives you because it, because it will be more um, precise. However, if we're just kind of ballparking it, 
take N1 minus one, your first sample size minus one, your second sample size minus one, and pick the smaller of those two. That will be your degrees of freedom. You'll actually have more degrees of freedom, but that will be a conservative estimate, and you can be sure that you're um, that you're you won't be overestimating your degrees of freedom, and we never want to overestimate it. What does the actual formula for degrees of freedom look like? Well, again, from a previous textbook, here it is. Not a difficult formula, especially in the days of calculators, but certainly a cumbersome formula. And again, if you're using software or some advanced um, calculator that has software, use the degrees of freedom that that device gives you. If you're doing it by hand, you could do this if you want to, or you could just pick the smaller of your two sample sizes, minus one. So this next slide here only applies to the current textbook, the one we're using while I'm making this video. I wonder how many years in the future people are looking at this going, man, he looks so young. Anyway, on page 429 of our current text, we'll take a look in a moment. There's a nifty flow chart and some nifty guidelines for doing a hypothesis test. So here's our nifty flow chart. We ask the question, do we know the population standard deeds? If we do, then you know maybe we're going to use the z-test if this condition is met. If we don't, well, again, if this condition is met, we're just not going to assume the population variances are equal. In fact, we haven't even learned how to tell if two variances are equal yet. Maybe we could do that test. Um, and that is a, um, that's an F test to see if two variances are equal, or is it two is it chi squared? I'll have to look that up. Um, but if we don't assume they're equal, then here's our T test, here's our S value. So our denominator for the um, T statistic, and we'll pick the smaller of N1 or N2, unless the calculator is gonna do it for us. And then here are our nifty guidelines for doing a hypothesis test. You don't know the sigmas. The samples have to be random and independent. Um, and either the populations are normally distributed or each sample is greater than 30. And of course, the reason for that is if this condition is met, then we know that the sampling distribution will be um, approximately normal. And then we can use the T statistic. You say, why does it have to be normal? Remember the T statistic was created or the T curve was created from normally distributed data. So we state our hypotheses, we identify alpha and only after we've stated hypotheses and alpha, then do we go out and collect data. And <clears throat> From our data, we'll get our degrees of freedom because we need our sample sizes to get our degrees of freedom. We'll determine our critical values if we're gonna use the um, rejection region method. Calculate our T statistic. And remember the denominator here is just this. And then we either reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. If we reject the null hypothesis, then there is sufficient evidence to conclude the alternative is true. If we fail to reject the null hypothesis, there is not sufficient evidence to conclude the alternative is true. So what do we conclude there? Maybe given the context of the problem, maybe we'll say, oh, well, given that the null hypothesis is what we assume to be true, until we get evidence against it, I'm going to assume the null hypothesis is true, pending further evidence. So we state our, our um, three-part conclusion statement. We reject or fail to reject the null. At what alpha? And then what is your conclusion in English? 
So the first two parts of that conclusion statement are in stats, the fail to reject or reject the null and at what alpha. The third part is in English. You state the context of the problem. The mean time it takes to do this is less than five minutes, something like that. So we do have a uh, practice problem on page 430 of our current text. I would encourage you to um, shut the video off and try to work that problem now that you've kind of seen this. And then come back to working this problem. All right, hopefully you've shut the video off, you gave it your best shot, now you're back. So the problem says the annual earnings of 19 people with a high school diploma and 16 people with an associate's degree are shown at left. And we're given an X bar, a sample S, and an N for our um, 19 high school diploma graduates and our 16 associate degree um, holders. Can you conclude that there is a difference? So it, we don't know which one's higher. We just know, is there a difference in the mean annual earnings based on level of education? Use an alpha of 1%. Assume the populations are normally distributed and the variances are not equal. So here's our claim that the mean score for high school grad or the mean pay for high school graduates is equal to the mean pay for associate degree holders. <clears throat> and is there a difference means not equal. We weren't told which one would be higher. And there's, so we just wanted to know if there is a difference. So that means not equal. 1% alpha, so we wanna be really super sure. And our smaller sample size was 16 associate degree holders. So we're gonna go with 15 degrees of freedom for this problem. So I calculate my T statistic, high school, um, associate degree. You say, well, the associate degree holders are making $8,500 more. Yes, but given the standard DEVs, is that um, a result of just sampling variation or is it truly um, demonstrative of a difference in their pays? And we come up with a T statistic of negative 4.954 which is way out here. At the 1% alpha and 15 degrees of freedom, my T critical value is negative, uh, or is 2.947, which means I'm gonna go, I had to take a half a percent here and a half a percent here to get my 1% alpha. The T critical for ha um, a half a percent tail is 2.947. And since this is not equal, I go 2.947 and to the right and 2.947 and to the left. Well, I'd go two negative 2.947 to the left. That's my rejection region. And these two green rejection regions add up to 1%. You can see that my T statistic of negative 4.954 is in this rejection region so that that area that it cuts off is certainly um, less than alpha. So I'm gonna reject the null hypothesis. And what conclusion would I draw? If you haven't gotten this far on your own, please write out your three-part, pause the video and write out your three-part conclusion statement now. Alrighty, what you should have written is we're going to reject the null at the 1% level. And there is sufficient evidence to show that there is a difference in the average pay between high school diploma holders and associate degree holders. We cannot say that the associate degree holders make more because that was not our hypothesis. We just wanted to show there was a difference. If we want to show that associate degree holders make more, the right thing to do would be to go out and gather more, um, more data and make the hypothesis um, mu of associate degree is greater than mu of 
the high school to hold. All righty, so let's stick with that problem, but we're going to change to that um, new problem. We want to prove that the average pay for associate degree holders is greater than the average pay for those with a high school diploma. So on that last slide, what three things would change? Go back, look at the last slide or look at your notes. If I wanted to show that the associate degree holders actually made more than the high school diploma folks, what three things would be different? Clearly, the null hypothesis would be different. Also, because at the 1% level, I would only be doing a right-tailed test, all 1% would be on the right side. So my T-critical would be positive 2.602. And then, because I'm showing that the high school or the associate degree is greater than the high school diploma, my T statistic would be positive in this case. So that's it for a two sample, um, two sample T test for means when we don't know sigma and the um, samples are independent. You might say, well, when would the samples be dependent? Well, they're gonna be dependent when we do matched pairs. If you don't remember matched pairs um, um, experimental design, go back and look in our early chapters on matched pairs. And you'll remember that we took two people or two subjects that would be very similar in whatever it is we're measuring. We assigned one to this treatment and one to this treatment. Well, we can't say they're independent anymore because we put these two together so that we could separate them. So in our next lesson, we're going to learn how to do a t-test for um, dependent samples, which would be matched pairs. So that's all I have for this lesson. Have a great day.